Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar today on our private well and on-site wastewater treatment system assessments. Um, this program, these assessments were developed uh, through the U of I and the State Water Survey uh, with support from RCAP and um, the US EPA. Next slide. Uh, as you're familiar, if you're familiar with our webinars, this is part of a national program. Again, it's funded by US EPA to support private well and on-site wastewater system owners um, through RCAP, which is who funds us. Um, and we work with RCAP's national office and their six regional affiliates uh, for who are the boots on the ground part of our uh, effort. They work directly with well owners and on-site system owners um, all over the country. This webinar is being recorded. It'll be available both under our webinar section of the private well class and on our private well class YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions, there'll be time at the end uh, for those. What we ask is you um, put questions either in the chat or question box. Uh, Katie Buckley's here today and uh, helping organize all of this and she'll track those questions and we'll uh, bring them up and answer them at the end. Um, and uh, as far as on-site wastewater information, um, we have a sister program called wateroperator.org that provides uh, mostly information for centralized water and wastewater services, but we do have some on-site information there that's available, and it's a good resource uh, for documents related to on-site, um, everything, everything related to on-site uh, systems. Okay, next slide. This is available for credit through NEHA and Illinois LEHP credit. Um, this is the first time we've done this particular webinar, so uh, everyone who is seeking CE uh, continuing education credit should be able to do that. Um, there are a couple handouts related to um, certificates, and also if you're interested in either LEHP credit in Illinois or NEHA CE credit, use this email address, info at private well class, to let us know. And um, we monitor whether you're on today and how long and how active you are. And that all goes into whether uh, this is approved for credit. Um, I believe this was approved for two hours of credit. Um, next slide. So RCAP. Um, RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, is um, their national offices in DC. They're made up of six regional affiliates. Here those are in their names. Um, we're, we're in Illinois, so we're part of the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership uh, area. So they have, I think, five staff in Illinois alone, um, over 200 staff nationwide who work, uh, they're technical assistance providers. They, most of them are licensed water or wastewater operators. Um, they also have staff who are private well experts and on-site system experts. And so we work with them uh, when, a, you know, if someone has a question for us and uh, they're in whatever state, we can refer them to the right RCAP office. Or if you want a well assessment or this on-site assessment, um, you can let us know or you can contact your region directly if you're whatever state you're in and we'll get that information to them. Um, and so these are the boots on the ground folks who uh, they can also, if you're an EHP and you wanna do, um, say you wanna put on a workshop for the folks in your district, your local health district or your county, um, we can get you in contact with the RCAP person who can either bring in experts or be the expert and help organize uh, a workshop uh, in your area. Uh, we've done a lot of that in the past. They've, uh, they speak all over the country and so if you're interested in that, you can uh, let them know directly uh, at their, you can find them online, or again, you can contact us and we'll relay the message for you.
Hey, Steve, are you still there? Uh, Steve, we can't hear you. Are you there? You know what I did when I went to this slide? I hit my space bar to move forward. And because I'm not in control of the slides, um, that muted me. So I apologize. So you didn't miss my whole spiel about the water survey. Oh, man. Um, well, uh, so the state water survey was formed in 1895 um, because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks through our state legislature. Um, in the first five years or so of our existence, we sampled all of the water supplies in the state, um, all the wells and, and many of the rivers. And um, we've done a lot of work, especially on the wastewater side in the 1910s and 20s, seminal work on treatment technologies and new methods for uh, treating our waste instead of uh, the way things used to be before that. Um, today, the water survey has uh, atmospheric sciences section, surface water, groundwater. Um, we do a lot of applied research as well as house the state's well logs. Um, we take requests from well owners um, in Illinois for sure and all over the country with our private well program. So next slide. This is just two, I'm gonna show two pictures here. Um, we're in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, uh, where the University of Illinois is. And in 1915, um, this picture's whited out a little bit in the top, but behind this picture in the background is the university. There's a little steeple you can't barely see. Uh, this is Urbana's septic tank, which was their wastewater supply in 1915. Uh, that straight pipe you see on the right side, next slide, um, ran straight to Salt Fork. Um, and so you can't really see the arrows, but if you look at the shade from the tree, it's got a little black line that goes to a gray line. Um, that's all the discharge from the septic system going straight into Salt Fork. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, not an ideal situation. Um, in, in 1924, I believe, Champaign-Urbana uh, put in a, a a wastewater treatment system in Urbana Champaign Sanitary District. And, um, you know, back in those days was when uh, the United States was really learning about all the issues related to our septic uh, and sewer issues. And next slide. Um, so again, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm a hydrologist at the State Water Survey. I manage the private well class. Today, uh, Sally Dolan, who's an environmental public health specialist here at the Water Survey, who started with us in August, um, is gonna present on the assessment tools and Katie Buckley is also with us today. Um, she is taking your questions. She keeps us organized and did all the prep work uh, for the webinar today. And so um, if you, again, if you have questions as Sally goes through the presentation today, put them in the chat or question box on your GoToWebinar window. Um, we keep a list of those in a Google Doc that Sally can bring up at the end. And Sally and I will go through those. Um, and we'll stay as long as there are questions to answer. So uh, next slide. Um, I do want to acknowledge Sarah Hager, who's the past president of NAURA and um, is at the University of Minnesota. Uh, when we developed, we just developed the on-site wastewater treatment system tool uh, as a companion to our uh, private well assessment tool that we developed in 2016 or 17. Um, Sarah was instrumental as well as the folks at RCAP Solutions, their wastewater working group, in providing comments, review, and suggestions for this new tool that you're gonna learn about today. And Jennifer Wilson, who's part of our staff, um, also uh, these tools are a fillable PDF, so it's actually really easy to use in that respect uh, in the field even. And um, yeah, that's, that's the acknowledgements today. Uh, next slide. I do want to mention that as part of the grant with RCAP, now is a partner, and they developed this on-site wastewater treatment system user guide. Um, if you haven't seen it, Katie's going to put the link, because it's kind of a long URL, in the chat box um, so that everyone can see that and download it. You can also look it up on Nowra's website, but it's uh, it, it really has all the basics, especially today, on-site wastewater treatment systems have become more advanced. Um, they're used for other things like irrigation. Um, you know, there's and there's advanced systems that are taking out nitrogen and other things. It's not just your standard old septic system uh, like it was in the old days. And so this guide has a great uh, um, overview of all of those things, including issues you need to be concerned about um, in maintaining those and troubleshooting problems. Next slide. And uh, lastly, we do this every webinar. We we expect everyone to participate. 
Uh, it's a simple poll question on um, who you are, basically. Um, we're trying to understand who our audience is, and we also uh, report that to EPA as far as you know poll, uh, poll numbers um, so that we can show them, one, that we're reaching folks that are all related to these industries as well as homeowners who may have private wells or septic systems. So Katie's going to launch the poll, and uh, we'll go from there. Yep, so the poll is launched. We just want to know which role best describes you today as a participant on our webinar. Uh, we do realize you might fit into more than one of these categories. Uh, just select the answer that best represents you today. Give everybody a few seconds to get their votes in. All right, we have 83% of the attendees have voted. We'll give you all about five more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And I will share the results. Uh, about half of you are coming from a regulatory agency today, and the rest of you all fit into one of the other four categories. So we're so happy to have you. All right, Steve, I'm going to throw it back to you. All right, so with that, um, let's introduce Sally Dolan, who's uh, our environmental health specialist here at the Water Survey. And Sally, I guess, yeah, take it away. Uh, thanks, Steve. Hello, I'm Sally Dolan, and like Steve said, I started here with the Water Survey um, in August, so I'm really happy to be here today to do this presentation. Um, a little bit about me, I got my start um, in, in environmental health at a local health department. I was a health inspector there, and so I was cross-trained in food, private wells, private septic, and solid waste. So I did a little bit of everything each and every day. So I'm really happy to be here at the water survey now. Um, so today we're going to be discussing our two assessment tools. We have the one for private wells and then one for on-site wastewater treatment systems. And as an inspector, you wear several hats. And so you never know what situations you're gonna end up with with that day. So. This is just a, a tool to put in your toolbox, so whenever you're out there, you can be the best EHP that you can be. So the first one that we're going to discuss is the private well assessment. Um, the University of Illinois put together this assessment tool in 2016, and it's modeled after a sanitary survey. So we're looking for the vulnerabilities um, in a private well to try and help the, the homeowner find out where potential contamination could be happening to make sure that the quality of the water that they're drinking is the best that it can be. So when you do one of these assessments, it's going to provide a great opportunity to educate a well owner about specific management practices they should be aware of, like sampling, or ensuring their well is properly sealed and to understand how the well construction and geology of their specific well may impact their water quality. So for the well assessment, it is broken up into 18 sections. Each of these categories is designed to answer specific questions about a well. And then we also have a well assessment guide that goes along with it. And so with the well assessment guide, um, it's very comprehensive and it was set up. So for each of the sections, you have how to do it, whether you can do it before you go out in the field, um, some information to help you understand what to look for. So I can see where this would be very beneficial, especially for a new inspector to take out because it literally walks you through every step of doing an assessment. Now, the well assessment tool was found to be extremely helpful, but when it came to the septic system portion, 
there just wasn't enough information. And so the field personnel came to us and asked if we could develop a similar tool that would work for on-site wastewater treatment systems. So in 2023, uh, the OWTS assessment tool was released. It is estimated that one in five homes in the US is serviced by an OWTS, and most of the wells and septic systems are found in rural settings. Um, however, many of these homes are now switching over to rural water or public water supply, but they still have a septic system. So this tool was developed um, where you could still have an assessment done just on either your septic system or you could combine it with the well assessment and do your septic system. So you had a comprehensive uh, resource for both of those systems. The um, OWTS assessment is broken down into 14 sections. And like I said, it can either stand alone or go along with the well assessment. And while we currently don't have a guide for it, um, we are eventually possibly going to look at doing that, but we've got to get through some of these test runs first before we commit to anything on that end. So who does these assessments help? It was originally designed for the RCAP Technical Assistance Partners, or TAPS. And these TAPS are non-regulatory, and they respond to people with questions or homeowners who want more information all across the nation. So we've tried to include information for everyone across the United States. But then it could also be changed where an environmental health professional, such as a health inspector, could also use this as a tool because it would help you perform an inspection in a concise, clear manner, and it keeps all the information in one form. Then once you have all that information compiled, then well, or well professionals and OWTS professionals and homeowners would then have an extensive resource that they could refer to if they have problems or have questions. They have all this information compiled together. So how do you conduct an assessment? I, it's really the same way you would do an inspection. The only difference is what is your regulatory power? Um, if you're a non-regulator, non you want to call it an assessment. You can't go out and enforce any laws. And so you know, you're just going out to kind of help the homeowner understand their system. Where a regulator, you would be able to take these tools to help you perform your inspections. You know, they can be used with a homeowner with a problem, or I could really see the OWTS tool being beneficial if you go out for a sewage complaint. So how do I conduct an assessment? You simply gather up the information that you need after you've identified that there's a problem or a homeowner has a question. And then you head, excuse me, you head out for an on-site visit. The biggest tip I have when you do these assessments is to make sure you do your homework. Um, the more information that you have before you go out, um, the easier the assessment will go. But I do understand that those complaint calls never come at an opportunity where you can sit down and find all the information. It's usually I got to get out there and get those done immediately. But anytime you can get your homework done early, uh, the better off the assessment will go. So we're going to start off today with the going over the well assessment. Um, we actually picked an older assessment that we had done. Um, the reason we picked this one is because the owner was actually a chemist. So we have some pretty neat water sample results that we'll also discuss as we go over this um, that will really help you build a, a picture of what's going on with this well. Now, this particular well is a four inch steel cased well with a stainless steel screen and a large sand and gravel aquifer. Though it doesn't stand up very high, you know, we'd like to see it about a foot off the ground and this one's only about eight inches. 
Uh, there's no flooding or standing water, so there's really not an issue with it only being about eight inches. This is just a view from the backyard looking forward. Um, you can see the well just past the fence. But I want to point out that the area to the left here where the grass is mown and looks like there's a car sitting there, um, this is actually a, a rural subdivision. And when the farmer subdivided the property, he left this particular lot open. So he had a staging area for his farm equipment and he could access his fields from here. So he regularly leaves tractors and wagons and even fertilizers fertilizer tanks sit in this area. And about three years prior to this assessment being done, actually one of his anhydrous ammonia tanks leaked there. So when we're coming out and looking for possible sources of contamination, um, that is definitely something we want to be sure and put down on this assessment. Over the years, we've found that when you're doing your field map using Google Earth or Google Maps works wonderful. It gives you so much more detail than you'd ever be able to draw out. So in this particular case, uh, we have the uh, property of our homeowner, Dan, is outlined in blue. Uh, to the right of that, you see the empty lot where the farmer parks his equipment. And then up in the top left-hand corner, you can see just the edge of the farm fields and see that the farm fields actually do touch uh, Dan's property. And this here is the well log for our example. In Illinois, wells are permitted and inspected, and then the, uh, the well log has to be filed after construction. Um, and Illinois well logs are housed here at the Illinois State Water Survey, as Steve mentioned. So we're really fortunate because when we do one of these assessments in Illinois, it's extremely easy for us to find the information that we need. So there's a lot of valuable information here on this well log. And so if you start at the top left, you can see that this was a drilled well that is four inches in diameter to a depth of 238 feet. And then the casing is also four inches and goes to a depth of 230 feet. Well, the issue there is it doesn't leave any room for grout if you have a four inch hole and a four inch pipe. So in today's standards, we would want a little bit larger hole drilled so you would have room to grout it to make sure that you're properly sealing that well once it is installed. Then if you come down on the left-hand side here, I'm going to skip down to the pump information. So you can see that it was a red jacket submersible pump with a capacity of 15 gallons per minute and was set at 170 feet at depth. Then on the right hand side, you have the property owner's name. I know I ran into a case where uh, the local health department, the guy in charge of their well section knew the former property owner and was able to find me a well log that wasn't properly placed on the map because he knew who the previous owner was. So that information can sometimes be be helpful, but then it also shows you where the water is coming from. So it shows that we have a sand layer from 230 to 240 feet below the ground. Uh, then section 15 there in the center on the right goes over the casing. So it's 11 pound um, steel casing and it goes from zero to 230 feet. And we have our screen that then takes up that rest of that eight feet that goes from 230 to 238 feet. Um, then 16 and 17 goes over um, the pumping levels. I'm not really going to spend that much time on that. Uh, this was done back in 1974. So the thing that I'll point out is those pumping levels in that time range uh, with depending where you're at in the country, 
there can be a lot of change from 1974 to 2023 on how a well is pumped. So know that the information's there, but um, it may not still be valuable information. Then in section 18, it goes over the geology of the cuttings that are coming up as the driller is going down. And so it shows that that last 10 feet, they ran into a coarse water bearing sand, and that's where we're pumping the water from. Now, since the homeowner was a chemist, um, he wanted to make sure he had all the information he could find on his well. So he actually contacted the driller who drilled his well, and he was able to get additional information. And what's interesting on this particular one is underneath the screen information, they actually had a lead packer listed. So our homeowner wanting as much information as he could, and I believe Steve Wilson, who's also on the call, um, also helped with this, uh, but they were able to determine um, what this lead packer was. And so um, our homeowner, since it was done right around the time as the Flint water crisis, the CDC actually had additional information on their website. I did go check and it's no longer there. So I'm glad we still have this slide to show that um, they did show that lead packers could be a potential problem in a well if you have um, any kind of corrosion. Um, so the lead packer ended up being a piece that goes between the casing and the screen and kind of seals that together. So now I'm gonna switch things up a little bit and we are going to come over to how do you actually do these assessment tools? So I wanna start off with our homepage. So this is privatewellclass.org. And so from our homepage, you can come to the resource library, to these partner resources, and then you can drop down to assessment tools. Uh, you can also access it by simply going to privatewellclass.org backslash assessment, and that will also get you here. So you'll see that both of our tools are listed here, as well as our um, companion guide for the well assessment. So we'll just start with the guide here first. Um, as I said, it's very an ex it's a very extensive document. It's 25 pages long, and it goes through step by step, giving you the information of what to do before going on site. Your initial contact and it takes you all the way through giving you examples, giving you references, giving you resources to help you with each and every one of those sections. So then we'll come back and then we'll actually bring up our assessment tool. So let me scroll back up here. So with the assessment tool, you start off with just your um, general information. So the person performing the assessment, put in your information, then you go into your um, participants information. The one thing that I'll point out with um, section two here is just make sure you have all of the information. So if you're dealing with a renter and an owner, make sure you have everyone's contact information so everyone gets a copy of this if they want it. And then we'll drop down to section three here. Uh, this is for the water use. With the water use, you want to know what are they using the water for? Is it for human consumption, animal consumption? Are they simply using it for irrigation? Um, so if you can find out that information, that will help you know kind of the direction to take the assessment. The other thing I want to point out about section three is um, down here on the second page, we actually go over backflow prevention. Several people um, who own a well have no idea what black backflow is. And so this is a great opportunity to do an education to let them know, hey, you know, if you leave your hose hooked up all the time, you could possibly be contaminating your well without even knowing it. So it's just a good educational moment. And section four is all about 
spring information. Um, we included spring information on this because um, in reality, there's no difference between a spring box and a shallow well. They can have the same kind of contamination. So um, you just want to make sure that um, if they have a spring, it's treated you know, pretty much the same as a shallow well. So now we're going to get into section five, which is about the well itself. And since we have a well log for this particular assessment, we are going to actually bring those up side by side. So you can see them together. So in section five here, you know, it starts off if you have a well log. If you have a well log, that is terrific. Um, now, some of you may not know, how do I get a well log? Well, the first thing you can do is you can go to your local health authority and see if they have copies or if they know where to go, or you can simply Google it. So if you go to well logs and then put in my state, I'm actually not Wisconsin, but since that popped up, I will go there. I actually looked around and typing in well logs in a multiple variety of states actually worked. So with Wisconsin, it happens to be the very first thing. If you click on that, then you can come down and search the well records. So um, very easy to use. And a lot of states do have those searching capabilities. Um, if for some reason you can't find well logs for your state, send us an email and we'll see if there's something we can do to help you find those. Then coming back to this assessment here. Um, so if you find the well log online, you can hit yes. Or if you can only find a paper copy, then you would hit no for that. Then you can do what type of well it is. This is a drilled well. Is it screened? You can type in what interval the, the screen goes to. And then if it's a bedrock well, you can put the length of casing in there. Since the casing is can be so much shallower with the bedrock well, this is important information to have to know on whether or not um, you can have a potential for contamination from surface water if bedrock casing only goes to say 20 feet below surface. Uh, so then for additional information, I'm not gonna take the time to fill all of this out, but you can see that you can put in the year it was constructed, you know, if it's grouted, what the grout intervals are. And then there's all sorts of places where we've provided or boxes where you can add additional information that might pertain to your well record. And uh, then if you come down to section six and seven, these are about the pump. Um, so you can put in what kind of pump it is. Um, is it accessible when it was installed? I'm um, so, for instance, with our assessment, when they went out, uh, they found out from the homeowner um, that the pump had to be replaced. He thought that it had been replaced around 1986. And then he also said that in addition to the pump being replaced, um, that the pitless had a leak and they had to repair it. So then again, this is a perfect opportunity that you can say, hey, you had repairs done on your well. Did you also shock chlorinate once you were done with the repairs? And so it's another opportunity where you can do some education and let them know that if you do open up your well, it's best practice is to go ahead and chlorinate to make sure that you didn't inadvertently introduce bacteria into your well. Uh, so then we'll keep coming down here. And we have in section eight, um, the water levels and the flow rates 
Um, so again, you could either take that information off the driller's log, or if they've done a pump, pumping test, you could also enter that information here. Then in section nine, uh, we have the household plumbing. Uh, this particular house, the well was installed in 1974, but he wasn't sure exactly when the house had been built. It was somewhere between 1974 and 1977. So the plumbing was definitely installed prior to 1986, um, but it did have PVC. But one thing to note was that it did have some brass fittings at the kitchen sink or at the kitchen um, faucet. And so I'm using Edge right now, and whenever I use Edge, I do have this ability um, to add in text. So you could put add kitchen sink and faucet. And so you can add in text that way as well if there's not um, a fillable form where you need it at. And then he did not have any of these following things. Then we come down to section 10. Um, section 10 is all about the septic. Um, we're going to be going over that here in a little bit. So um, you can see how small this section is and why the field personnel needed another tool that was more inclusive when it came to a septic system. So now we're going to come down to sections 11 and 12 here. And just got to find my right thing here. So for question or for section 11, the miscellaneous questions, um, one thing to point out is do they have a generator? Um, having an emergency power source is important because if you lose power, you also lose that power to your well. And so you don't have any water. I grew up in the country, so I remember a couple times having power outages. Um, usually they happened in the winter with the ice and we would not be able to, you know, take showers. And um, my aunt lived in town, so we would go fill up five gallon buckets to be able to flush toilets and things like that. So I'm um, letting them put the thought of having a generator in their back of the mind might help them in the future if they do have a power outage. Uh, we also ask the distance to um, the closest public water system or rural water district, um, because if there's major problems with their well, it may be um, in their advantage to just go ahead and hook up to a public system. Now with this particular well, um, since Dan was a chemist, um, he had several tests done. And so he ran his first test in 1992, then he ran again in 2002, and then in September of 2015. So with this particular well, we have you know, a, a really good history where we can see any changes that have occurred. And then you can see from this example that you have a lot of options. Um, so if they test for other things, you can go ahead and type those in. Otherwise, you know, we do have a comprehensive list here. The things that are interesting about um, this particular water sample is he did not test for bacteria or lead. Um, and so, we found that interesting that those were the two things that he opted to not test for. So now we are going to switch back to our PowerPoint here. And so these are Dan's test results. So this comes from um, his sample in 1992. Um, the first thing that he did was he treated his 
untreated water. He sampled his untreated water because he wanted to know what the groundwater was like before it, you know, came into any of his filtration systems. So then you'll see that iron is at 2.99, um, sodium's at 26.2, and the hardness is at 328. So that's what he started with. So then we come to the treated. And once it goes through the softener, uh, you can see here where um, under treatment, it shows that it was uh, goes through the softener. And the iron is at um, 0 0.03 and the hardness goes down to one. However, if you notice on the sodium, it actually jumps up to 184.0. So this would be a, a case where we always recommend that um, if someone is having, um, or when they get their well sampled, that you might wanna go to your doctor if you have you know, like a low sodium diet and ask your doctor, hey, when I run my softener, this is what my sodium goes up to. Is this too high for me? And have your doctor help you determine if that is a, a problem or not. So then Dan, again, wanting to know everything that he could about his well, he also um, collected a sample from the softener right before it regenerated. And so you can see these levels here, you know, with the iron 4.66 and sodium at 36.6. Then he took a sample right after the softener regenerated, and you can see the difference in those totals there. You know, everything's dropped um, except for the sodium, which again has increased. So it let him know that the regeneration cycle of his softener was truly working. Then we jump ahead to 2002, and this sample was collected from the outside tap. Um, and there's really not a lot that has changed from 2000 or 1992 to 2002. And that's what we expect to see in groundwater. We expect it to stay pretty static. Um, and that's why it's rec recommended that inorganics and metals are tested every three to five years. Um, and that way um, you can see that if there is a change that that indicates that you need to investigate and see if there is a problem either with your well or the aquifer that you're pulling the water from. So the one thing that did change was the color did increase to 10, um, but we don't know if that's anything to be concerned with, or is it just that in those 10 years, sampling techniques improved, which changed the, the number. Then we fast forward to 2015. Um, we see that um, in the untreated, um, while the iron potassium and those didn't change that much, when we come down to turbidity and color, those really did increase. And then the odor, um, it now has a hydrogen sulfide smell. And so, you know, that is something to note that from 2002 to 2015, there was a change in that. Then um, he ran it through a filtration system and a softener, um, and he collected it from the kitchen sink this way. And again, you see that these figures really drop, but that sodium goes up to 198. And it does clear up the turbidity and the color pH is 8.1, and it still had that hydrogen sulfide smell. Well, the one thing that um, was different from 2002 to 2015 is that he did have a reverse osmosis system put in. Um, so for the treatment, it goes through a filter, it goes through the softener, and then it goes through the reverse osmosis. So he collected it from the reverse osmosis tab. 
and look at all those list than symbols that are listed. So know that the reverse osmosis is really doing its job. The one thing to note, though, is that it does drop the pH to 6.2 from 8.1. So in a case of reverse osmosis, um, if you already have water that's acidic, it could drop it down to a level that it could be corrosive. So we always recommend that you only use reverse osmosis on the kitchen sink and um, not do a whole house reverse osmosis um, so it doesn't cause corrosive water going through your pipes, which could lead to problems. Okay, so we're gonna come back over here to our assessment for a second here. And we're gonna come down to uh, the treatment section here. And so, like we said, um, you know, you can take this water treatment section and I'll show you how we filled out Dan's assessment. Um, so he has shock chlorinated his well before, so that's marked as yes. Um, and then he, the reason he did it was four years prior to the assessment, there was a change in sediment and they thought that it was a from, a, from bacteria. Um, they have permanent softener. And then in the 70s, they had a water softener and a sediment filter. Um, but he has a continual black sandy oils, oily sediment um, that is filling up the sediment filter. And then in 2015, um, he installed that reverse osmosis. So if we come back here, Here are the examples of Dan's filters. So we have a filter on the left, which is a brand new one. And then we have one on the right um, that has only been used for two months. So Katie, if you're out there, uh, I would like for all of you to type in the chat, what do you think is causing this filter to turn black? And Katie will look at your answers and see what um, you think might be causing these sediment filters to turn black. All right, we have some answers coming in here. Some folks say clay, uh, iron, um, total dissolved solids, bacteria, manganese, manganese, iron, someone says mold. Just a few of the answers that are rolling in. Someone says an underground okay. tank leak. <laughs> Hydrogen sulfide. Well, you should things. caveat this that it's natural groundwater. So I've actually seen the correct answer several times. So we actually believe that this is from manganese. And if we actually go back um, before we go through a lot of the filtrations, I guess it was back farther than I thought it was, but on one of these, it has where the manganese was actually over 50. And so we think manganese is the reason for the black. But of course, now that I'm in the webinar, I cannot find that. So. Oh, the, here it is. So if you look at this one, the manganese is at 50.2. So, uh, our best guess is that it's from manganese since that is typically what causes the blackness to occur. Okay, so now let's go back and finish this assessment. We're almost done with this one. So then whenever you come back to this, um, then we have sections uh, 14 is the geology, which a lot of that can come off the well log. And then in 15, this is what you'll fill out whenever you actually go out to do the assessment. So this is the visual 
inspection of the well. What do you see? Um, is it properly vented? Is the vent tube screened? And so it's real easy to click on these and show whether or not that there were any problems. So like for this one, um, it's is the soil sloped away from the well in all directions? I, in this particular case, it was actually just fairly flat. So again, we can use that text box and just put in that it was fairly flat, that it didn't really slope up or away from the well casing. And so it was intact and, oh, so this is yes. And then um, this last one here, I just wanted to point out that while he did not have a well house, um, noticing any evidence of animal activity inside a well house um, is definitely something that you want to um, put down. And then if there's anything else notable, again, we have these fillable sections and then does it meet well constructions construction standards um, in this case it did but if it does not then you could easily type in in this area um, where they fall short and how they could correct that so then we have an, another little quiz for you so We've gone through this well assessment. Um, so I want to know what are some of the potential contaminants for this well? Could it be A, neighbor's well or septic system? B, a farmer's equipment in the fields? C, his septic system? Or D, all of the above? And I know Katie said that she kind of had to possibly word these questions a little differently, um, but I'd like for you guys to participate in the poll and see what your thoughts are on what potential contaminants we should let this particular homeowner know about. So Katie, if you could start that poll, please. Sure thing. I'm going to launch the poll here. All right, so this one I didn't have to edit any of the responses. They all fit within the limited character <laughs> fields that we had, so uh, go ahead oh, and good. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and select the answer that you think what the potential contaminants are for this well. And we'll give it a few seconds so you can just think on it. And hopefully we can get most of you guys to vote in this. We have about 70% voted. We'll give it a few more seconds, get your answers in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and I will share the results. And Sally, uh, it looks like there's a resounding response for D, all of the above. <laughs> Well, I'll good go job. And, I'll go ahead and hide the poll and you can address the answer. So, oh, I didn't need to exit out here. Hang on just a second. I, so you were correct. All of the above need to be addressed and need to be um, pointed out to the landowner. Um, the one thing to... Um, note that I haven't even told you guys about yet is uh, one of the neighbor's septic systems actually had a problem and could have very well been um, a potential contaminant for this particular well. So any wells that are nearby could be potential contamination. Um, the neighbor's aerobic septic system, having fields be so close by, um, having the farm equipment left especially since we know that there was an anhydrous ammonia leak just a couple of years before this. And then always a septic system can always be a potential problem as well. So then we go back to our field map and then we mark down where all these potential contaminants are in relation to the well. So I was saying that the neighbor's 
um, septic system had a leak. Well, it's in this front yard. I just don't know which side of the yard, but it actually backed up into this U part of the drive and was flooding this part of his yard. And so it took him a couple months, but he finally did get the um, property owner to address the problem and get it repaired. Then the last thing that you do on your um, assessment is you give recommendations. Um, since he was a chemist and he had done so much lake work and finding out things and sampling his water over the years, um, you know, we just want to address that lead packer and point out that it's probably not going to be a problem unless groundwater is con corrosive, but it is still a concern. So, you know, maybe he should go ahead and be testing for lead in the next um, test that he does. And then also to um, be sure to annually test for coliform and nitrates. It's an expensive way to make sure that surface water isn't um, infiltrating your well and causing contamination. So what else would you guys have recommended? Or do you have any questions about the well assessment? If so, type it in the chat and we will address that at the end. So now we're going to move on and we're going to go to the on-site wastewater treatment system tool. Um, this is our first example for using the tool. In this particular case, um, the family moved in about two years ago and they added two bedrooms onto the house um, as soon as they moved in. Um, so the addition turned it from a four bedroom house into a six bedroom house. There's five people, two of which work from home and they're it's a, a blended family, and so there's her kids, his kids, their kids, and so the older kids will also frequently visit. So there's a lot of people that are coming and going through, through this home. Uh, the water is supplied by a well, and they have a conventional septic tank and drain field for their um, system. And the one thing that the homeowner did refer to is that um, he had a wetland full of frogs um, that had formed to the north of the drain field that was in an uh, area that was at a lower elevation than his yard was. So this is the Google Earth view of the property. And so we can see a lot um, of the features of this yard. Um, but the interesting thing came is um, there were two of us that met out there and we weren't quite sure where we were going. So we just pulled up Google Maps. And this was the view from Google Maps. And I know um, any of the inspectors that are out there instantly see something right away. So the first thing that we can see here is we can actually see the outline of the septic tank. And so when we were out there, we asked him, you know what's going on and they actually had to dig up the septic tank to um, get it pumped out as soon as they moved in and it was completely full whenever they did come and do the pumping the next thing that you'll notice is you can clearly see the three trenches of the septic field um, with that nice lush green grass when everything else around it's pretty pretty dead and brown then this is the area where there's now a wetland full of frogs but you can see that back when google maps took this picture that was a pretty dry area and you can see that there's some kind of rocks or something um, that were not visible when we were out there and then we have the well just to give you a comparison um, on the left hand side of the screen, that is actually where the, the well is located at. So then we can go back to, to Google Earth and we can put all these things in that we've noticed. So like there was a, a fairly good site garden just off of that wet spongy area. Um, there's actually a fence that goes around the house and inside the fence, um, he actually has a chicken coop and two goats. Um, so is that the reason the 
the septic tank still doesn't have anything growing over it? Is it the goats that as soon as those tender little plants start popping up, are the goats eating those down? And so this kind of gives us just a, an overview of the property um, that is easy to show where everything is at. So one of the first things that I did when I did this assessment was I contacted the the health department that the property was located in, and they were able to provide me a um, sewage permit. And so you can see from this sewage permit, um, it's a 1,050 gallon tank. Um, it does have baffles. Um, it's 140 plus or minus feet. And then you see with the pressure line, it has the asterisk. Well, I didn't include it in this, so it would be bigger, but there was actually a note at the bottom of the, the page um, that the well had not been installed yet. And so this is just an estimated number of how far the septic system is from that pressure line. And so you can get some information, you know, it has the chamber system, it's total of um, 195.75 lineal feet. Um, they're 24 inch trench. And then you just come down to the bottom and it gives you all the information about um, how deep it was excavated and how much cover they put off of, put over it. Also included in this um, sewage pile was the percolation test. So we do have the percolation test. Um, in Illinois, percolation tests are no longer allowed to be used um, because they were generally done by the homeowner and they just weren't reliable. So now they, um, require a soil classification, which has to be provided by um, a certified soil classificator. Um, and so all systems installed since 2014 are required to have that report, even though many states still use that percolation test. Um, now this particular percolation test, it's not great, but it's not horrible. So they were allowed to put in a conventional septic tank and leach field. So this is the drawing that was included with that well permit. Um, I actually used to work with Mike and so his drawings have always been uh, done to scale and he does a really good job. So you can see all the detail that he puts in there. So we have our leach field that has three trenches with nine sections of chambers, and it's got that 1,050 gallon septic tank, and then it's 20 feet away from the home. And then the well is over here on the northwest corner of the house, and so it is a good distance away from the septic. But then when you come here to the Google Maps view, um, you can see where that septic field completely lays over the view that you're seeing. So if you go back and forth between the drawing and what we see, we can definitely see that we have um, an issue with that leach field. So here are the pictures that we took when we went out to the, to the home. And so you can see that uh, where they dug up this septic area or the septic tank to pump it out it still doesn't have anything growing over it and then if you this is the leach field looking towards that wet soggy area and so you can see in the grass it was hard that day you couldn't necessarily tell but when you look back at the picture and you can say, oh, I, I can kind of see where there's a difference in the coloring. But then back at that tall vegetation, that's where things got interesting. So when we walked back behind there, this is actually what we saw. So we had this ponding that was occurring, um, but it was at just a low enough elevation that um, all the excess water that was coming from the leach field was actually pooling in this area. Um, there was no odor at the site though, which was 
uh, quite surprising to us. So now we're going to head on over to the OWTS tool and show you how that works. So we just leave our assessment tool. If you did uh, fill it out completely, you can download it and save it um, to your computer that way. Um, but then we'll just click on the on-site wastewater treatment system assessment, and you'll see that it looks very similar to the well assessment with that assessor information at the beginning. Um, the one thing that I will note is that we do have both um, where you could mark um, if it's just the OWTS assessment only or if it's in connection with a well assessment as well. So you do have that option to mark. Uh, then you'll come down and you want to put in the um, reason for the assessment. So like for this one, um, we could put in that a wetland has formed near the drain field. So you can just put something like that. Um, and then for both the well assessment and for this one, um, it is good to go ahead and put in your information um, with latitude and longitude and where you got it. Um, so you can easily find it. Um, some, some places you can find the discharge locations, others you cannot. So if you can find it, great. Um, but it's not always possible. Then you do have um, where you could put in your, your permit ID numbers, um, the dates of the permit, who it was issued to. And then since I was doing this as a test, um, I went ahead, even though I had that permit, I went ahead and filled out this section here. And this is actually the section that led to the conversation of, oh, well, as soon as we moved in, I added on two bedrooms. So now that was, you know, clue number one of you've got six bedrooms, two bathrooms, five people, two who work from home. You know, that's that's starting to build the picture of why this wetland had formed. So, you know, they were doing a, a load of laundry a day. They did not have a garbage disposal, they're there year round. Um, so actually filling that section out was kind of what started putting the pieces together on what was going on with this particular property. And we also have um, in information here where you can put um, their contractor if they have pumping services that are different and you can put all those contacts in here so the homeowner has everything in one document. Um, then section number four, um, we have the water usage. Um, so again, this is just a, a small little section. We're just looking to see um, what kind of water in addition to um, the standard, what, what else could be going through the system such as a uh, a hot tub or a high flow shower, just so uh, just so we're aware of it. Um, Katie and Steve, can you still see my screen? It just popped up with a, a message to me. I um, still I can, see. Yeah, uh, I can still see the assessment. Okay. <laughs> it just came up with a, a bright red message, so I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. <laughs> Okay, so then going on um, to number five, this is our, our landscape properties. So um, in this particular case, um, the, the property was actually up on a hill. So we were upland um, and we were not near any kind of floodplain. Um, but then, you know, whenever you get into, is it affected by surface water? You know, we do wanna mark that, um, there's always water standing in that area, even during dry spells. What's the vegetation like? It was definitely lush and green, even during dry spells. When we were out there, it hadn't rained for a while. So for there to be that kind of ponding definitely points towards um, the 
septic field being the problem. Um, the other thing that we found out was that his kids had ATVs and they would frequently drive over the leach field. So it gave us the opportunity to educate him about staying off of um, the leach field. Um, then you come down to the geology and soil properties. Um, we were able to get a lot of this information off of the systems per permit. Um, we did have a perk test. We did have a final report, and I would list that as average permittability. If you have any additional factors, um, there is the area here that you could put in that information. And then if you come down to section seven, um, this goes more into um, information about the, the system itself. So the house was built in 2006. We do have those as-built records. Um, it was also installed in 2006. It was not a replacement. So you can see how easy it is to just simply click on these, um, you know, the PDF fillable form. And then the last service, they had it pumped out in 2021. They've never had it dyed. Um, it's concrete tank. And then you could go through and fill all of this information out based on the conversations that you've had and compare it to the documentation that you have on that particular system. Then in the, the next couple of, um, we're going to start getting into the questions that you'll ask whenever you're actually out on site. And so, um, in this case, it does not have advanced treatment, um, so we just skip that section. Um, and then for the final treatment, it has trenches, it has three of them. Um, so, and there's no other treatment that is attached to it. And so then whenever you come to your site observations, um, the way that we've separated these out is so you only have to fill in the sections that pertain to that particular site. Um, so for this one, um, we do have a septic tank. The risers were not visible, um, so we cannot answer the next two questions. And then, you know, if there's a pump tank, sand filter, advanced system panel, you could fill all that information in. Um, but for this particular case, we dropped down to the drain field and there were no noticeable odors, but there was a soft, mushy area where the affluent had come to the surface and the vegetation was definitely more lush and green. So then um, we do go over some other systems that you may encounter or irrigation. Um, but then down here at the bottom, we have these miscellaneous questions. So with these miscellaneous questions, um, we just need to find out some more about this particular home and system that maybe we missed earlier on. Um, it's also a good way, you know, to ask, do you have emergency power source? They did not. They didn't even think about um, that they were on a, a well, you know, and so how would that affect them if the power went out? This particular septic system doesn't necessarily require power, but it was just a, a good education to teach them about it. Um, they did actually use additives. So again, it was a, a good teaching moment of, you know, they're, they're not really necessary or recommended to, to use. Um, so we just use this information to ask those extra questions um, because you may find out in this section that, um, well, my wife just started a dog grooming business. And so, you know, we've really increased the amount of water that we're using or we've, you know, we're doing cottage food. And so we're we're adding a kitchen into the garage. And so this section here will just help you start finding out any of these systems or any of these questions about the system. It's also a place where you can ask, um, you know, if there's any 
gray water systems that aren't going to the septic. So you can address if they have a softener, where is that water going to make sure that, you know, it's not going into the septic system and potentially causing problems, but making sure that they're up to code on what they are doing with it. So then, you know, you can fill that out and then if there is anything else worth noting, you can put it in this section as well. So then section 12, we have a place that if you are the kind who likes to draw a diagram and you don't like using Google Earth, you definitely have a, a place here where you could do your drawing if that's how you prefer. And then at the end, we do have our final recommendations. So for this particular case, uh, I did want to, uh, they were fairly new to owning the home. They had just moved in in 2021. Um, he didn't give an indication whether or not he was really familiar with septic systems or not. So I wanted to make sure that I gave them not only site specific um, recommendations, but also just some general um, best practices to make sure that they were knowing, you know, don't drive your ATVs repeatedly over the leach field. Don't put grease down your drain. Um, so kind of those broader recommendations, as well as, you know, you've added two bedrooms on, there's five people living in the house. And with that amount of usage, I, it appears that your drain field can't handle that amount of water. And you've got to get someone out here immediately to seek a remedy um, to get the ball rolling where um, it will be remediated. Uh, but then I also gave him um, instructions that in the meantime, you know, uh, your installer is not going to be able to come out the next day and redo your septic field. Um, so in the meantime, make sure that you're staggering water usage and not running the dishwasher, the washing machine, and taking showers all at the same time to put less strain on the system. Um, then I also looked up and with um, a 1,050 gallon septic tank with five people, it's estimated that he's going to need to pump, pump it out every two to two and a half years over the recommended three to five years. So with that smaller tank, they're really going to have to increase their maintenance and make sure that they're pumping it out um, on a much regular basis to extend the life. Um, and then I also gave him the information that um, where his sewage permit um, was on record with the health department. So if he misplaces the copy that I gave him, he knows where he can go to get a new one. So that is our first example. If there's any recommendations that you would have given to this homeowner um, that I did not. Be sure and put that in the chat. And if you have any questions about that particular one, then just let us know in the chat. So I do have one more um, example to go through for the OWTS system or assessment. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this one is because um, it is an advanced system. So we actually have an aeration treatment unit on this particular house. Um, so with this one, um, again, we're in a rural subdivision. Um, it's on a well as well as a septic system. But with this particular one, neither homeowner has ever lived in a home with a well and a septic system. They've always lived in town. They've always had city water and sewer. And so this is a, a big learning curve for them. Um, but we were very lucky in the fact that they are willing to learn and they want to do the right thing and they are willing to make changes um, to help the life of their well and their septic system. So again, the first thing that I did was I reached out to the local health department 
and I found their septic permit. And so whenever you look over this, um, you can see, you know, who the contractor was, where it was installed. Um, they give directions to where it was at. Um, but then it's a, a four bedroom home um, with a water softener. It's on a private well. And then at the very bottom in that section six, um, they're estimated to have 500 gallons be treated per day. And then they've put in an aerobic treatment system that's adult whitewater DF-15. And then it also lists that the um, alarm is in the basement and that it will discharge to the surface. So included in the um, sewage permit packet was this drawing. And so when I first saw it, I really had a trouble making out what it said. You know, it, um, it didn't really scan well. Um, but this was the second page that I looked at. And so I was trying to make sense of where everything was. And luckily, the uh, inspector did include um, a digitized form. I Again, I, it would still be nicer if there were a little more descriptions, a little more, um, a few more dimensions and, um, you know, how far is the well from the subject, you know, that information would be really helpful, um, but it was not included with this. Uh, one thing that was interesting with this particular health department is they do um, require a service contract to be maintained with the health department. So since we had new homeowners, um, we wanted to make sure that they were aware of this rule so they didn't get in trouble. And they did actually have a service contract um, that they had done because of this rule with their health department. So this is the Google Earth view of the the home site. Um, the thing to note out with to note with this particular um, setup is there are actually three elevations to this property. So this front yard was one level, and then your backyard sloped down. And then you have this floodplain because where these trees are back here is actually a farm drainage ditch, small little creek that flows back here. Um, so the homeowner has had only lived there less than two years. And so when we ask him, you know, does the creek flood? Um, she was able to tell us just a little bit about what a, a neighbor had told her. So there's still a lot that we don't know. But we did, once we were out there, we did come back and we put the information back into Google Earth, drawing out and labeling where the different things were um, to identify where everything was. So uh, I've already gone over the tool with you. So I just wanted to show you a little bit how it would look whenever you fill everything out. So again, um, you know, adding latitude and longitude just really helps for someone in the future to be able to locate the system. Um, so we have all that information with this particular system. We were able to um, decipher where the discharge location was. So we also included it. We've got our permit numbers in there, you know, who it was issued to, physical address. And again, I, even though I had the permit, since it was a pilot program, I went ahead and asked those other questions um, just to have the information. Um, so then on this one, you know, for the water usage, it is on a well. They have water purification system. Um, but I did mark other under landscape properties. Uh, they're not in a direct floodplain, 
Um, we do know that there is some potential for flooding there. So since we don't know the historical data of that creek, it's just worth something noting so um, they can be aware that there is a potential for the problem. There was nothing that we noticed with surface water. Um, all the vegetation was the same color. And then um, they only took the lawnmower over the, the system. Um, with this one, um, the system permit did not have a soil classification or a percolation test with it. Um, the person I spoke with at the health department was very helpful and she actually sent me um, other homes that were in that subdivision to see what I could find and the only um, soil classification or percolation test that were included were those that um, had a standard septic tank and field were included, but none of the aerobic units in that subdivision, which I believe three out of the seven homes had an aerobic unit, um, but I could not tell whether it was a, a geology problem or if it was due to the sloping that they just weren't able to put in a standard leach field at this property. So I didn't have that information to uh, be able to know that for sure. Then in section seven, um, everything was built in 2003. We did have some as-built records. Um, it was not a replacement system, but it is that aerobic tank um, they do have a contract which comes out, they send a tech out every six months. So whenever we did this assessment, the last service date was March of this year. And they were really concerned because since they were trying to learn about their septic tank and how to take good care of it, um, they had made sure that they did not flush anything um, other than toilet paper and human waste down the toilet. They had switched toilet papers because they had read online that their, the particular brand that they had used in town was known to clog septic systems. And so they were really doing their homework and trying to uh, change their habits to make sure they weren't adversely, adversely affecting their septic tank. And when the tech came out, he told them, a year after they had had it pumped out from initially moving in, that it was getting full and needed to be cleaned out soon. So they were really, really concerned with um, what was going on with their system. So we went out there and just want to point out what kind of system we have here. So we have the, the riser right there, um, the inspection port, it does have a chlorinator, so we did use this as an opportunity to verify that they were using chlorine tablets specifically designed for septic systems and not dropping pool tablets in there, um, which they have their um, contractor as the one that provides the, the tablets, so we knew that was good. And then um, kind of a funny thing is, um, her husband is a geologist and so we kind of chuckled at the fact that they have fake rocks in their yard when he's a geologist but it is really nice that they had these because not only did it add aesthetic but it also added protection so whenever he was mowing he didn't accidentally hit it with the mower um, i've been on many inspections where those pipes are cut off level to the ground um, so it was nice to see that they just put a decoration over it instead of cutting it off so they could mow over it. And then the last thing is, is um, where that last arrow is, is actually where the system discharges at. So this is me trying to find um, the, the discharge. Uh, there was a bunch of creeping Charlie that had grown over it. So... I kind of cleared away the the vegetation to make sure that it was flowing. And then you might think that, oh, what's this 
you know, they have this tall, lush vegetation at the end of it. Well, it's actually purposely put there. Um, she works for um, a government agency and was able to get wetland plants. So she has actually created a native Illinois wetland plant garden in that area. Um, so the grandkids don't get into the area where the affluent will be coming out. Um, there was no standing water in this area though. And so those wetland plants were really helping for when the water does get discharged, um, it wasn't allowing it to stand. Uh, so then we go back and so for section eight, we have a fiberglass tank that was 50 gallons. Um, it's about 45 feet from the home and about 90 feet from the well. And again, the well was up on top of the hill where the septic system was downgrade from the well. It was last pumped out in 2022 when they first moved in. Um, but again, they were really concerned because um, they were told that the tank was filling up quickly, but the previous owners indicated that they didn't have any problems. And so you only have two people who are trying to take steps to not cause a problem, yet they still seem to be having a problem with their septic tank. Oh, apparently I had put in highlights that I had forgotten about. So we'll move on to the next one here. Um, so this is an aerobic treatment unit. So um, in the previous example, we skipped section nine, but with this one, um, you know, we did fill out that it was an aerobic treatment unit. Um, and then with their contract, um, every six months, it is part of their contract that they clean the air pump filter, they check the diffusers, and they check the amps during that check. Um, and then for the final treatment, it discharges into that creek floodplain, um, and then they do have the chlorinator attached to it. So here's uh, just a couple additional pictures for the for the site. So this is the on the left. You have the the clean out uh, that goes from the house um, to the um, system itself. And then in their garage, in their laundry room, um, they have their um, alarm system. The alarm had never gone off since they had lived there. So we made sure to educate them that if your alarm does go off, you know, call this emergency number, alert them and follow their guidelines on what they say to do next. So then, um, you know, we went out and we actually looked at the the site. And so that's where Section 11 comes in. And so we filled out the one section that we skipped earlier about the advanced system panel. And so as you could see from the picture, it was clear around the panel. Um, you could see the alarm light. The alarm was connected. It had not been disabled. There was a a nice bright shiny sticker on the front with the contact information. And then we educated the homeowner on what does the alarm mean. So then for the uh, additional questions, um, nothing new was um, found out about this particular system. Um, so they weren't using it for anything you know, no cottage businesses or anything like that. So the big question was that the homeowner had reported that it was pumped out a year before, or when they moved in a year, and a year later, a service tech was reporting that it needed pumped out very soon. You know, next time we come out, we're gonna have to pump this. And that really seemed excessive to them because there were only two people living in the residence. Um, they had switched to septic recommended products such as toilet paper. And the previous owner reported that they didn't have any issues. So they weren't sure what in the world was going on with the system that would be causing it to fill up. So 
now it's quiz time again. And I want to know, what do you think was wrong with the system? Was there A, nothing is wrong, the tech gave bad information and the system isn't filling too quickly? B, a small crack is formed in the line between the clean out and the tank, allowing sediment to enter the tank. Or C, their grandchild put something down the toilet. So Katie, if you could open up that poll, this must be the poll that has the short dancers to it. Yep, this is the one. All right, I will go ahead and launch this poll. So I tried to just trim down the responses a little bit so it would all fit on your screen and also I was out of character. So uh, <laughs> put in your answer on what you think is wrong with this system. And like before, we'll give everybody a few moments to get their answers in. All right, we have about 65% of attendees have voted. I know some people are putting their answers in the chat box. Uh, if you can, if you've already done that, that's fine. Um, but just feel free to just to go ahead and click the poll answer as well. All right, we'll give everybody a few more moments. All right, about 73% of you have voted. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and I will share the responses. It looks like 75% of the people that voted think that B is the correct answer. So they think that a small crack has formed in the line between the cleanout and the tank, allowing sediment to enter the tank. Sally, I will hide the poll and then you can tell us what the right answer is. Okay. All right. Okay, so 75% of you agreed with our assessment. However, we were all wrong. So the only thing we could come up with is that maybe when they had moved in or the previous owners had moved out, that they had driven over that line and a, you know, a, a fracture had occurred in the pipe allowing dirt to come in. Well, we gave the recommendation that they should contact their provider and ask them to scope the line from that clean out out to the um, septic tank. And so when the homeowner um, contacted um, their service provider, they sent out someone different to do um, their last inspection. And whenever they inspected it and looked at it, they said, I'm, I do not see anything wrong. It is not filling up too quickly. There's no edit, evidence of sedimentation. So I don't believe that there's anything wrong. I think you're doing great. And uh, nothing seems to be the problem. So, I, but the thing that I want to highlight is that our recommendation of reaching out and talking to the contracted maintenance company opened up that line of communication and it gave the homeowner um, the the confidence that they could go forward and say, hey, you know, if, if it really is filling up too quickly, instead of just paying for it to be pumped out again, I, I want some more information. So I the assessment did exactly what we wanted it to do by it, opening up that communication and educating the homeowner on their system. So this is the recommendations that I had put together for um, the system. And so again, that top one of, you know, you're being told it needs pumped out more frequently. So talk to them and look at inspecting that line between the clean out and the tank. And it, Luckily for them, it turned out that there wasn't a major problem, so they didn't have to dig up their yard and replace that that pipe. Um, so, and now they're also a little um, more at ease that um, things are are good. Um, and then again, since they're new to um, septic systems, I wanted to make sure that they had those. Um, 
good housekeeping tips of not to put you know grease and oil down the drain never drive on it and don't part or uh, don't plant trees or shrubs or anything that's too close to the system so again we just gave those general information and then i did put some additional resources um so i put the link to their local health department and then a lot of the homeowner septic information that epa has available so then uh, this OWTS tool is new. Um, so far, we've completed only these two assessments that I've shown you on the webinar. Um, our CAP staff is um, supposed to be completing 180 of these assessments over the next three years as a pilot project. And then once we receive those comments back from our CAP, um, we will be making changes, additions, edits to it. Um, so once we get kind of that feedback, uh, then we'll start um, compiling all those and redeveloping uh, version two that we expect to come out in 2025. However, the tools are available free of charge for you guys. Um, so we really encourage you to go try it, see if it works for you. Um, and then feel free to give us the feedback. Um, we would love to hear from you, know how it's working for you, um, and how it can be changed to um, better assess the systems that are out there. Uh, so then, just to let you know, um, items that are coming up still. Um, next Tuesday, we have our last private well class for the year. Uh, so we will be doing Well Care 101 um, on Tuesday the 19th from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, if you are a, a procrastinator like some people in my family, uh, you may still need your two CEUs for, um, oh, uh, private wells. Um, so you can definitely log in next week uh, for that webinar. And then, um, the team here at the University of Illinois that manages the private well class and wateroperator.org, we are going to be launching a third website um, next year that will focus on decentralized wastewater. Um, so if you know of any events that are occurring in the decentralized world, um, we are looking to um, have an event calendar where we can let um, installers and pumpers know where they can get CEUs. Um, so that will be coming sometime next year. And then starting on April 1st of 2024, um, here at the private well class, we will be um, managing the US EPA's private well hotline. Um, and so we're looking to kind of revamp that and make that a place where it'll be a go-to for people to come to when they have private well questions. And then the last thing that I would like to point out is that in May of 2025, the private well class um, will host their um, fifth private well conference. It will be in person. Um, we're looking that um, it will most likely be held somewhere out west is kind of the direction that we're looking at for this one. Um, but if you would like to, all of our previous conferences have been recorded and are available through our website. Well, Steve, I didn't do too bad. I had planned on ending at 2.45 and it's 2.43. So now we will open it up to questions and see what kind of questions we have here. Yep, so Sally, we were re receiving some questions as you were doing the assessment. And so I kind of um, indicated which assessment the question was being asked about, so. Yeah, I can take the first two if you want. Okay. Um, so it says, what about the boron result? If you don't remember from the private well assessment, um, the natural groundwater had boron at 365 micrograms per liter and um, after the RO unit, it went down to 316 micrograms per liter. Um, but it still stood out on that result because most of those constituents were had a less than sign. 
and so it seems pretty high. Um, it turns out that boron, um, one that's not very high, the health standard for, well, there is no MCL for boron, but the lifetime health advisory level for boron um, from the US EPA is five milligrams per liter or 5,000 micrograms per liter. So it's well below that. Um, and it turns out, depending on pH, boron and uh, has a hard, RO has a hard time removing boron when it's uh, boric acid. And that's what I found online. <clears throat> One of the advantages of Sally doing this today was I was able to look some of this stuff up. And so, uh, because I don't know a lot about boron because it's not regulated, um, but that's what that's what it turns out. I and mean, there's things you can do with the water uh, to kind of treat it in advance to make it more uh, removable. Um, borate, apparently, which is um, easy to remove using RO. And as far as the pH drop, um, you know, groundwater has natural minerals in it, uh, magnesium, uh, calcium, and all those things. And RO takes all of that out. And so, one, it's removing things that are uh, have an alkaline uh, slant to them, if you will. And also, uh, what I read today is that when you purify water like that, um, it's much more readily able to absorb CO2 from the air. Um, and one of the things I found said, if you have a, a glass of water that's uh, from an RO unit and it's basically, there's nothing else in it, it's just pure water. Um, if it sits for an hour or two, the pH will drop as much as uh, down to 5.5. And so that's likely uh, what's going on here. When you take the mineralogy out of the water, um, that's kind of the buffering that keeps the pH up and then it absorbs some CO2. And that's what I learned today. So um, yeah, the rest of these are for Sally. Sure, no problem. Uh, so number three, how do you know the ponding from the septic uh, was from the septic and not a spring or some other source with, without sampling? Uh, that's accurate. We did not sample. Um, what we were basing our um, assessment from was the fact that uh, it had never occurred before. Um, if it had been a spring, uh, there had been, um, you know, the home had been there since 2006. Um, so a, a spring would have, you know, potentially come up prior to um, the 2023 assessment, you know, so there, there was such a change um, in the area from the Google Maps, you know, where that uh, vegetated area hadn't occurred to a couple of years later, you now had vegetation. So um, that would be something for um, whenever they contact the licensed installer, um, you know, he may want to do the sampling to ensure that the ponding was from the septic system, or they could call out the, the local health department and um, they could help assess that. Um, with number four, um, could a determination be made on a surface pond elevation in the depth of the chamber? Was the chamber at in the water table? So for that one, uh, do I? I'm just going to try and pull up the information that we did have. So when we go back to um, our permit, you know, we know that the excavation was 19 to 28 inches. Um, and then when we come to our percolation test, um, I was trying to see if there was any indication where the water table may be, but we were up on a hill. And so that, that water table wouldn't be, you know, high enough that it would really um, cause the, the ponding like what we saw. Um, but again, you know, we're out there making our best guess, I'll, I'll call it, um, for any additional, um, you know, how deep is the, 
the chamber sitting now, um, that information isn't on the um, permit. And so we, we know a variety of the depth. Um, so I would refer to an installer for those questions to verify that they are definitely overloading the system. But the fact that they've added on two bedrooms, um, there's five people, two who are home all the time, um, and it's it was not designed for a six bedroom, five person house. You know, it was designed for a much smaller usage. Um, so that will be for the installer and the health department to go out there and make those determinations. Hey, and Sally. then the last one, yes. So also, you know, the even the Google map showed um, from the surface, you know, from looking from above uh, the, the photos that you could see exactly where the chambers were. Isn't that also an indication that there's, you know, is much greener around? Yes. Uh, where, isn't that also an indication that there's and th that is a, a a big indication that there is a problem with your drain field having that um real lush green vegetation especially when the rest of the yard was completely dry um yes. it'd be one thing if you know it was springtime and the entire yard was green but since we have those three strips that tells you that the drain field definitely needs looked at. And then for our last question, how close can trees be planted to a septic system? Um, you're going to want to stay 20 to 50 feet away. And it, it also depends on the type of trees. Um, any water loving trees such as willows or sycamores or some of your maples, um, they're going to go as far as they can to try and find that water. Um, so the further you can keep it away, the better off you are. Um, the other thing is is um, to look at the species. You know, like I said, um, go for something that's not quite so water loving and doesn't get those fibrous roots. Um, it's my aunt has a, a silver maple in her backyard that. Um, the cracks in the sidewalk, you know, you get these tiny little fibrous roots that are growing up and causing her bricks to to pop up. So you definitely want to uh, pick a tree that isn't known for causing problems if you want to plant it, um, even in that 20 to 50 foot range around your septic system. But the, the farther away you can get, the better off you'll be. Does anyone have any more questions? I don't see any more coming in. Oh, uh, here's one more. All right, I put a new one in there. Um, so I do not know um, if they had an affluent filter, um, but I have a feeling that the entire um, leach field is going to be replaced um, because whenever you look at the septic drawing, um, you can see that it since it doesn't have a distribution box, um, you know, if if this middle one gets clogged up and it's going to push water to the others, um, I, I think there's a high chance that you will have had stuff come out of the septic tank causing it to clog. And I, I really foresee that they're going to most likely have to get a, a new leach field. Um, when we were out there, we did identify that the yard was plenty big enough. Um, so they do have the room to be able to um, get a replacement field. And I would also um, think that they would want to also look at 
installing maybe a 1500 gallon tank over uh, the smaller tank. If you're going to go through all that effort for a new new field, you may want to go ahead and just upgrade the septic tank as well. We got a few We've more. Got a couple Sally. more here. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Should well bleaching be a part of regular annual maintenance? Um, so when it comes to bleaching of the well, um, what you want to do is do a coliform test and see if it comes back as positive or not. Um, so with the coliform bacteria, um, that's going to tell you if there's a potential for um, contamination to the well. So if that comes back, then you would bleach. If it comes back fine, then there's no reason to bleach unless you've done a repair to your well. And then if you've done that repair, um, then you'll want to bleach it to be on the safe side. Steve, do you have anything else to add to that? No, just, yeah, it should not be part of an annual process. It's only if you detect something, uh, detect bacteria in your well or in, you know, coliform or E. coli. It should be a prescribed solution, not a maintenance thing. Uh, chlorine can cause, uh, it's an oxidant, so it can leach metals, um, depending on how you mix it. and you know. It can leach metals from your pump or your drop pipe. So it's not something you should just do. Okay, and then on the last question here. Oh, no, I didn't scroll far enough. So question eight here. Uh, what are some, or what is some basic well septic information that we could tell new owners? Are there any good websites for this? Uh, well, I will use this as a, a chance to promote our private well class. Um, so with the private well class, um, in addition to these webinars, we also have a 10, soon to be 11 lesson class um, that is geared for well owners. And so once a week, um, they get emailed a PDF that they can read on their own time that goes over um, all the well basics that um, you can think of. Um, and so that is a really great great way they can just go to our website and sign up for that and then like i said they just get emailed those pdfs and then for septic uh, the epa um, does a tremendous job um, especially with their septic safe week um, so if you look up epa septic safe um, they have all sorts of brochures and um, a lot of information on their websites um, which it's just US EPA slash septic, or it's epa.gov slash septic. And so if you come to this part here, you know, do your part, be septic smart, um, and they have all sorts of um, different things on their website. So, you know, they have helpful tips, um, education material and additional resources so um, you can go to about septic systems and it gives a bunch of information um we, we actually do a webinar every july on septic systems and about half of it is going through this web page and so you could go to our septic webinar on our youtube channel or on uh if you look under our past webinars and find that information, it's a pretty good video. Okay, and so then for question nine, what is the best way to remediate an on-site wastewater treatment system that is too small for the load? Um, it's going to unfortunately be a new system. Um, your two options are stop using so much water or increase um, the size of the field. Um, there's really not anything in between those two things. Um, if someone knows of something, put it in the chat, but I am not aware of something that either you use less or you have to build a bigger system. And then does Illinois allow for size reduction in chambers with sidewall discharge consideration? I do not know the answer for that. Um, 
I have not worked at the local health department for a couple years, so I don't want to answer that because um, the rules may have changed. Um, I would recommend going to, um, if you work for a health department, um, to go to IDPH and ask um, whoever works in your region, ask them for their expertise and ask them. Um, if you're a homeowner, then you should definitely reach out to your local health department and they would be able to answer that. And then how about keeping the existing septic tank and a new tank in series? And that could be, a, you know, that, that will be um, on the installer in the health department to determine if just they could add an additional tank or um, with the, the size of the area, if they would want to just enlarge the tank, but it could go either way on that. Okay, do we have any additional questions? I think that might be all, Sally. Um, if you don't mind, uh, scroll down a little bit on your Google Docs so people can see how to uh, get a certificate of attendance for attending today's webinar. Just send us an email to info at privatewellclass.org with your request, and I will get those out to everyone who has requested one. We do not send them out automatically. Um, it's pre-approved for two CEs through NEHA and Illinois LEHP, and if you're not credentialed with any of those organizations, you can still request a certificate and submit it uh, to your credentialing agency. Okay, well, it is 3.01, so thank you so much for attending today. I hope you guys learned a lot, and we hope to see you next Tuesday for WellCare 101. Have a great day.